Okay, well, I, I might get started now. So welcome to today's uh, signature lecture from Professor Cyril O'Connor for the ARC Center of Excellence for enabling eco-efficient beneficiation of minerals. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea, and community. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that back to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people today. And so we're very lucky Cyril has agreed to Okay, well, let me introduce Cyril. Many of you, I think, know Cyril. He has been the um, uh, director of our uh, International Advisory Board for the first half of the center. And he's been in the um, in July in the annual meeting in Newcastle. And he visited a number of, of nodes the year before. Um, he's from the University of Cape Town. And he's going to talk today about the uh, development of flotation chemistry over the last about 70 years and what's going to happen going into the future. And a lot of that is going to be what comes out of this center. So with that, um, I'd like to, to let Cyril take the floor and um, let us know what, what he's learned in the last 70 years. Thanks very much, George. And uh, can I just begin by thanking everybody and you in particular and Michelle for arranging this lecture. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be invited to present this lecture to such an eminent audience. Greetings from Cape Town, where we are in the midst of a heat wave, having had the coldest and wettest winter in living memory. Um, so what I've done in this paper uh, is to really go back in time. And my, my starting point is the first International Congress which took place in London in 1952. And I'm trying to focus also on people. Who were, the, who were those champions who made many of these great developments happen? And, uh, and I think that's an important journey for us just to remember and recall these, these great people who went before us. And then as uh, George has mentioned, I'm going to wrap up with just mentioning some pretty obvious but important challenges that we should be sensitive to and aware of as we move forward. And so let me get going. Um, no, don't tell me I've got a frozen screen. Right. So it's generally accepted, as you people in Australia know very well, that the first major industrial application of the flotation process was in Broken Hill in Australia in the first decade of the 20th century. And in fact, in 2007, I recall, we had a celebration in Brisbane of that event. Obviously, flotation per se started way back in the 1860s in Germany uh, as the flotation of graphite using diesel oil. And the first IMPC was held in London in 1952. And if you want to see the proceedings of that Congress, which are quite instructive in, in many ways, because Somehow or other, I think we forget that many of the things we think we've suddenly discovered were published many years ago. They're on the IMPC website, which I believe is now back up and running again. It was down for a while. Uh, Ralph Holmes can brief you on the status of that. Now, since then, there have been many such congresses all over the world. And in fact, the next congress will be the 31st, and that will be held in Washington, D.C., in USA, in October next year. And that promises to be a super event, judging by the number of papers submitted. So as I've just said, this paper attempts to review many of the major developments since 1952, and I'm focusing on the chemical phenomena occurring in the flotation process. Now, this is an important slide because it shows a picture of the two people that I believe were the really great scientists, engineers in the realm of flotation, especially flotation chemistry in the 20th century. And on the left, we see Antoine Gaudin. And on the right, we see a young Doug Furstenauer in his early days at Berkeley, 1965. It's always interesting for me to remember that Gaudin was actually born in Turkey. His father was a railway engineer, a French railway engineer. And when uh, Gaudin finished his undergraduate studies, he applied for a job at Istanbul Technical University. But they thought that he wasn't good enough. So he went off to another university called MIT. So uh, this little quotation is a private communication to me from Doug Furstenauer, who I asked a few years ago to give me his sense 
having been so close to Gaudin or what role he believes Gaudin played. And uh, Doug has made the point that Gaudin was the founder of the scientific basis of mineral processing research, particularly flotation. And his major philosophy was that academic research should be directed towards the delineation of the basic principles underlying the processes involved. And I'm going to come back to that because there's always been the debate in research, generically research, whether it's push or pull. Does industry, does the academe push industry or does industry pull research? And I believe in flotation, it's been the pull. The operators have pulled the academe to understand and try to understand what was going on in the processes involved. So this uh, figure on the right here, my good friend uh, Rohan Yoon believes that on the basis of this figure, uh, first and I should have got the Nobel Prize. It's a, it's, a, it's a diagram which shows results obtained in a microflotation cell in the flotation of quartz using uh, an acetyl amine, a classical collector. And on uh, the left-hand axis, we've got plotted contact angles in the open circles. We've got surface coverage, which is plotted in the solid filled circles. And we've got flotation recovery, which is the square open blocks. And on the right, we've got zeta potential. The interesting thing about this plot is what has happened in a number of parameters. You'll see if we look at the zeta potential, which starts and the, and the, the x-axis is pH. The zeta potential starts at about somewhere around about minus 40 millivolts. And as is traditional, it becomes more and more negative as the pH gets um, uh, uh, greater. But there's a sudden switchover at around about a pH of eight or nine. And you can see the zeta potential suddenly goes back to about zero. And that's accompanied by two other observations. The first is it coincides approximately with a full surface monolayer coverage. I want to make a com comment about surface coverage as a parameter. I think often we see uh, results presented as dosage, but a much more insightful way to present a, a collected uh, addition is the surface coverage. And so we see that the zeta potential switch happened at a point where the surface coverage was approaching a, a total monolayer. And at the same time, you can see there's a very um, high sudden increase in the flotation recovery and in the um, um, uh, and in, in the contact angle. So in the this this was published in 1957. The work was part of P Doug Fersenau's PhD in the early 1950s, and it was also part of a, a pioneering work that they were undertaking to develop instrumentation to measure zeta potentials. At the same time, uh, Gaudin began to do a lot of adsorption work using radioactive traces. And those were also pioneering experiments. And in 1955, they published a whole lot of papers where they showed how, uh, where they determined adsorption isotherms on a variety of minerals. So, so the first uh, tiptoeing, so to speak, into the whole realm of the relationship between the surface charge on a particle as measured by zeta potential, the adsorption of the reagent onto the mineral was all taking place at this time in the mid 1950s at MIT under the leadership of Gaudin. And so I've referred now in the third bullet to this figure on the right. Then of course they started to try to understand what was happening at the pH that I have indicated. And uh, just let me get my little uh, pointer, uh, sorry. Yeah. So the so this area here was the focus of attention. The sudden, really high rise in surface coverage, and it also coincided with the saturation point uh, of the the amine collector. And so um, they noted, of course, that with increasing concentration, there were the sharp changes, which I referred to. And the, since the charged heads orient towards the charged court surface, they postulated the formation of surface aggregates, which were termed hemimicelles. And just before my talk, I was having an offline discussion with George and Peter about the great Tom Healy. And Tom, uh, as a young researcher, was working with Fersenau at this time, and he was certainly involved 
in the development of this concept of hemi micelles. However, in terms of the theme of my presentation, I'm trying to uh, highlight the fact that there were other similar breakthroughs happening elsewhere in the world. And I think often that we have denied ourselves the opportunity to really understand what was happening globally, largely as a result of language barriers presented by papers published in Russian, or indeed, as I'm finding out more and more as I go regularly to China, how much work was going on in China in those times. So in 1959, Bogdanov showed the relationship in a very similar relationship to between absorption density, flotation recovery, and contact angle. And then in 1961, which had run about the same time, the Jagovin and Dukin showed that flotation recovery is best when the surface charge on the air bubble and the mineral surface are opposite in, in sign. Hindsight has now shown us that that is not the case, but it's interesting that at that time, there was this view that it was an electrostatic interaction between the particle, which was negatively charged, and the bubble, which was positively charged. Bubbles are, in fact, negatively charged. So this was the concept of the hemi micelles. This is a figure which I'm sure you've all seen many times before in your life. This, uh, on this side here, we see these amines as single ions at low concentrations. Now, remember in that figure I showed you, which I said was such a seminal breakthrough, the hemi micelles really only started happening when the concentration became very high and the coverage was close to one. Here you can see the coverage is probably only about 10% if you just want to use a figure. And then we move to higher and higher concentrations, and then we start seeing this phenomenon of the molecules absorbing uh, onto the quartz uh, uh, surface as shown in this cartoon. And then finally, in this cartoon, we see the formation of hemimicelles. So this concept of hemimicelles became very popular at that time. The interesting question, of course, is what happens to the next layer? And this cartoon, and I use the word cartoon advisedly because that's all they are, they're what we think may be happening. This cartoon suggests that we then have a hydrogen bonding occurring between the alkyl ends of the amines and we get the second layer. That's not at all certain. And I've actually discussed this with Doug Furstenau, who, who also thinks that this is, at present, one could suggest it's conjecture. We are not absolutely sure what happens to the second layer. But nevertheless, the concept of hemimicelles was a major development in flotation chemistry in the late 1950s. This is quite an important diagram because it's, it starts telling us about the whole role of pH in flotation. And here we have a diagram showing the flotation recovery of pyrite as a function of pH. And here we see this interesting phenomenon that round about a pH of five to seven, we get zero recovery. And so the question is, what was happening at this point? Uh, and it was proposed that you were getting a species, a hydroxy species, and this has now become a, a popular explanation for these sorts of phenomena, uh, and a hydroxy species complexing the xanthate ions out of the solution, depleting it of free xanthate ions, and thus inhibiting further flotation. The concept of speciation then became very popular in the 1960s, and that coincided with the great work by Marcel Pourbet, who was a Belgian a chemist, and he was the pioneer of Pourbet diagrams, which in my little world, I insist that every single student studying flotation should have a copy of Pourbet's uh, uh, diagrams, which are available free on the internet these days. And so here we see a simple example of an iron water system. These, of course, were pioneered by the corrosion community, but the flotation community has certainly made extensive use of the concept of what species are present at different pHs. So we owe a lot to Marcel Pourbet, who had no involvement in flotation at all, and as I say, was really much more interested in corrosion theory. But these Pourbet diagrams, of which there are many thousands today, are critical in helping us to understand what species are present at what pH and EH. And of course, this gave rise to the whole concept of making sure we understand the EH-PH relationship in a flotation investigation. This table, which was developed actually at the old, what's now called MINTEC in South Africa, it was used to be called the National Institute for Metallurgy, 
by Noel Finkelstein, one of the great surface scientists of that uh, period, and Sid Allison. And what they did here was they measured rest potentials. And I remember asking Sid one day, what was your objective? He said, we had no idea. We just thought this was an interesting set of experiments to do, and we published this work. Well, it's been probably one of the most widely quoted tables in, in the citation index in flotation. And so what we have here is all the rest potentials. And what has developed out of this is an understanding of the relationship between measuring the rest potential and the nature of the xanthate species in the sulfide flotation. Of course, the literature at this time was dominated by sulfide minerals and xanthate as a collector, as indeed it was in terms of oxide minerals, the quartz amine system that I've just referred to, of which there's an, a plethora of, of publications. So this, uh, this concept of rest potential started to take on a lot of interest around the world. And this was again in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And people were starting to identify the nature of the xanthate species that were present by measuring the redox potential. And still today, this is a key experiment to be carrying out in order to try and get an understanding of whether you've got a metal xanthate forming or you've got a diazanthogen forming uh, or otherwise something which is uh, not really well known. So the diazanthogen xanthate couples started to become of great interest. And of course, in Australia, you had one of the greatest exponents of this whole body of, of theory, which is Ron Woods, the great Ron Woods, who really uh, is one of the great pioneers in the whole area of electrochemistry in flotation. So, um, so in terms of contact angle, this is quite controversial, this slide, and I know a lot of people have had a bit of a query about my making these comments, but uh, I hardly need to tell you how much literature there is uh, in journals all over the world on contact angle measurements. It was a popular game to play if you were a PhD student, you had to measure contact angles. And of course, there was some pioneering work. The work by Joe Kitchener, which I'll refer to again later, because Joe Kitchener is certainly one of the great legends of flotation chemistry of the 20th century. Jan Leyer and George Poling in Canada, similarly. And so there was a lot of work going on on understanding the relationship between the spreading coefficient and interfacial tensions, measuring contact angles. And so there were studies which I've just referred to, the first in our figure, which I referred to in one of my early slides, focusing on the relationship between contact angle and the general area of wetting. Again, Kitchener's work at Imperial College, Jim Finch and Ross Smith in Canada, Kellebeck in Canada, a lot of in excellent work being carried out in the 70s, 60s and 70s. At the Brisbane conference in 2007, to which I referred earlier, the celebration of the centenary of flotation in Broken Hill, our good friend Nagaraj, who's nowadays at um, Columbia University, was at Solvo for many years. Uh, he has a view, and he's made the point in a paper, a very excellent paper in this particular series, that contact angles determined polished flat surfaces serve little purpose in predicting flotation recovery of real minerals. I think it's hard to argue against that point of view. It's a point of view. There are, of course, it is well known that there are other uh, methods that can be used to determine contact angle, but uh, to use the, uh, the parameter of a contact angle on a polished flat surface is a very interesting academic exercise, but whether it plays any real role in predicting flotation recovery is, doubt is questionable. The Washburn method, is an excellent method, but the problem with the Washburn method is to get reproducibility. But nevertheless, the Washburn method certainly brings us a lot closer to the real world of minerals in a flotation cell. And, if, and in our particular little world that we were working in, in Cape Town, we've been doing a lot of work lately on trying to show that the enthalpy of immersion, which is the energy, the, the exothermic energy occurring when water interacts with a mineral coated or not coated with a collector is an indication of hydrophobicity. So there are many areas in many ways in which hydrophobicity can be measured and contact angle, of course, has been the dominant one. But I think Nagaraj's cautionary note is worth taking note of, 
not to say that contact angle is not an important parameter to be uh, conscious of in flotation research. Now, uh, this I'm, my screen is a little bit uh, uh, covered here, but this is the hydrophobic force. Now, the hydrophobic force has been uh, somewhat controversial, but let's just go back in time. Uh, in 1961, De Jagerwin and Dukin, whom I referred to earlier, there were two good Dukins. There was a father and son. This was the father. They were the first to describe the bubble particle interaction by considering surface forces. Now, I don't need to remind all of you in this audience that the fundamental process in flotation is the bubble particle interaction. And they were the first to really start considering surface forces. That before a particle can adhere on the surface of a bubble, it's got to pass through what they call three distinct zones. Hydrodynamic, of course, that's the mixing phenomena in a flotation cell, diffusiophoretic, and then the wetting zone. And in the wetting zone, in turn, they, uh, uh, they suggest, suggested there were three surface forces, namely the classical van der Waals force, the electrostatic force, and structural forces. Now, Joe Kitchen and his colleagues and the colleagues were varied, uh, Janusz Laskowski being one of the more eminent ones. Uh, Israel Shaveli, by the way, should be noted. He was at Cambridge University. Joe was at Imperial College. And he was really responsible for developing a lot of the experimental techniques that the Kitchener group used in all of their work, their pioneering work in the 1970s. And they provided evidence that there was a third force responsible for the rupture of wetting films on hydrophobic surfaces. And it was, in another word, for the particle bubble attachment. And this force, as we all now know, is referred to as the hydrophobic force, which in a sense is a counterintuitive. It, it relates to the long-range interactive force between hydrophobic surfaces. So the hydrophobic force is a force occurring between two hydrophobic surfaces. It's a long-range interactive force. And... In the 1990s, Roho and Yoon, in pioneering work, and Roho has published some of the seminal work papers on this topic, has shown that the hydrophobic interactions can exist between hydrophobic bubbles and particles, which harks back to the Diago and Dukan idea of an electrostatic interaction. What Roho and Yoon and his colleagues and others subsequent to the work that they've done, uh, using atomic force microscopy especially, have shown that the Interactions are, hydroph are hydrophobic interactions between the hydrophobic bubbles and particles, the famous hydrophobic force. And here I pay tribute to these great men by showing their pictures. Joe Kitchener at the Imperial College, really one of the great pioneers of the 20th century in flotation chemistry. Roho Nguyen, still so jolly active today at Virginia Polytechnic, and the Yagovin from the old USSR, in fact, he was from Ukraine, uh, did pioneering work at that same time. And just a little sketch again to show this hydrophobic force where we've got von der Waals forces, we've got a, a range of forces, but you can see the, the in a car, again, in a cartoon, we see the concept of the hydrophobic force as particles approach bubbles, two hydrophobic particles approaching each other. So it's a very important breakthrough, and our, the research in this area still continues in a very active way, and it's a very interesting area of research. Now, this slide pays tribute to a whole range of people who were responsible for the development of experimental techniques, which assisted us hugely in all of the developments that I have been speaking of and will refer to in the future. The very early application of infrared studies by Peck and Wadsworth in the US, looking at early uh, acid adsorption on calcium fluoride. George Poling in Canada, Xanthate adsorption, 1961. I think that in fact was George Poling's PhD. Then Melgren in Russia, the first person to start using microcalorimetry. Uh, in, a, in a, what today, in terms of the development of equipment, a, a relatively uh, simplistic piece of equipment, but nevertheless, great work by Melgren in the mid-60s. Then back in, in your backyard in Australia, the hugely important development of QuemScan, mineralogy and the SEM, 
and the people whose names are always referred to when I ask questions of my colleagues in Syro, Reed, Gottlieb, and others, the whole area of automated mineralogy and the, the, the team at Syro deserves to take a bow because this it was a massive quantum change in our approach to flotation studies. Cyclic voltammetry, again, Joe Kitchener, and then San Chanda, who was worked with first and I, and then on his own, who sadly passed away at a relatively young age, San. Ron Woods, who I referred to earlier. And again, you can see that a lot of this work dominated by sulfide minerals and all of the work in cyclic voltammetry. Then the advent of Fourier transform infrared. So Fourier transform infrared, of course, was a major breakthrough in terms of infrared instrumentation. Jan Miller at the University of Utah, Lepinen at VPI working with Roha and Yoon uh, in collector adsorption studies. And then XPS, X-ray photo electron spectroscopy, where the French have played a massive role, actually. The group of uh, Lev Filipov at uh, Nancy in, in France doing pioneering work, not only Lev, but his predecessors on the surface chemistry of sulfides. And of course, again, in your backyard, back in Melbourne, where you've got the cyclotron available, some fantastic work being done uh, using that facility. And then atomic force microscopy, which I referred to earlier in the hydrophobic force arena, Rohan Yoon, Tom Healy, Jan Miller, Zengi Zhu, at the time he was working with Rohan, Zengi Na, Dean of Engineering at the Southern University of Technology in Shenzhen, uh, looking at bubble surface interactions, which I've just referred to in terms of the hydrophobic force. Sec uh, <clears throat> secondary iron mass spectroscopy, Nagaraj, uh, uh, both at, uh, at when he was a Cytec and then later Solvay, collector adsorption studies, Ramon spectroscopy, the great Indian, uh, Ron Woods again doing excellent work, and again the French uh, group of Lev Filipov doing pioneering work using Ramon spectroscopy these days. And then Roger Smart at the Ian Walk, a lot of excellent work that he did while he was there in time of right secondary eye mass spectroscopy, looking at surface species. And certainly I got to know uh, um, Roger very well. And I think the work that he did at that time with Andrea Gerson was really outstanding. And then X-ray tomography CT, Jan Miller again, still very active today, but Jan, the application of X-ray CRT to... Uh, to flotation studies. So these, these instrumental developments, I always equate this a little bit to the medical world. We all know that probably the heroes and heroines of the medical profession are those amazing people in the operating theater who control all those fantastic gadgets. And again, I think the use of these instruments, these instruments gave us opportunities to make many great breakthroughs. Now, the literature is replete with uh, reports on the interaction of xanthates with sulfides. And again, the, the literature is overwhelmingly populated with papers on xanthates on sulfides, much more than amines on oxides and, and other uh, important systems. Way back in the 1920s, uh, Gaudin uh, at MIT and Walk and Cox, of course, pioneers in Australia, doing a lot of work, that's 100 years ago, on the mechanism of the interaction between xanthate uh, collectors and, uh, and surfaces. And again, the first time looking at the competitive adsorption between xanthate and hydroxide ions and the whole concept of the importance of speciation diagrams to understand at what pH conditions hydroxide ions will be present, et cetera, et cetera. Taggart at Columbia, I'm told by uh, Doug first and I, that Taggart and Gaudin at MIT never saw eye to eye on anything. But I think that was healthy, probably, because there were a lot of debates in the literature that one can read about of Taggart, who adopted the principle that flotation was related to solubility product of the metal collector salts. And so there was some very interesting development. Of course, that predates my benchmark point of 1952. But here's an interesting paper. If you go and look at those proceedings that I referred to, which you'll find on the IMP website, IMPC website of the London conference, you'll see a paper by Salami and Nixon from Melbourne University. Now, I've asked a number of people, and I'd be delighted if George and Peter and, and, and even uh, Peter can ask Tom Healy, because I haven't been able to pick up much background on 
their, their, what they were doing at Melbourne at the time, what department they were in even. But there's a wonderful paper by them where they really start showing clearly that you've got the absorbing species of diazanthogen and how the diazanthogen is a strong function of the, uh, the redox potential inside the cell and how diazanthogen becomes is arguably the strong collector in a xanthate system. It's a great paper because till today, people are publishing work on this, and I often wish that they would at least reference Salami and Nixon as the people who really pioneered this thinking. And then in Russia at the same time, Plaxin and Besanov, looking at the role of oxygen. Other people have looked at it, but way back in 1957, the role of the oxygen is critical. And of course, if we look at the series of reactions at the bottom of the slide and the cathodic reaction of oxygen, the, the redox couple depends on the presence of oxygen. If the redox, if oxygen is not present, we're not going to get the couple forming. And so we know we have these various reactions. We have the, the possibility of simple adsorption of the xanthate ion. We have the uh, uh, oxidation to diazanthogen, which is strongly hydrophobic or we have the formation of the metal xanthate. And there's a whole uh, presentation that one could give on all the various ramifications of this uh, schematic that I'm showing here. But the pioneers were Gaudan, Walk, and Taggart, Salami and Nixon at Melbourne University, and Plaxin. And of course, Plaxin is famous in Russia because their annual minerals processing conference that they held in Russia is known as the Plaxin Readings, which is rather quaint. But the Plaxin Readings is the annual conference on flotation in Russia. And so here, just for the importance of acknowledging all of these great men, we have Taggart, Gaudan, De Jagerin, Ian Walk, about whom I hardly need to tell you, the great Sir Ian Walk, Plaxin that I've just mentioned, uh, Mori first and I passed away, sadly, a number of years ago. The great Doug, Doug is now 95, still sharp as anything, and and just the most wonderful person. And here we have George Poling, Ron Woods, who, if my memory serves correctly, sadly passed away in the last year or two. And uh, Nagaraj, and I tried to get a picture of Summer Sundran, but he's too modest. He wouldn't give me one. And of course, Nag has been the successor to Som at Columbia University. So these were the great people of that era. And not to forget that there were many people around the world doing similarly great work. Professor Wang Dian Zhua, who I knew very well, he passed away, sadly, about three weeks ago in Beijing. Uh, he was one of the really great researchers in China, uh, was president of Central South University. Professor Hu, who is his successor, just retired as the vice president of Central South University. Great electrochemist, the two of them. Now we have Paul Richardson from the USA, uh, the, um, where he did great work at the US Bureau of Mines. And then, of course, we have Keith Sutherland, well-known to all of you in Australia, Valentin Chantaria, now 85 years of age, but still very active, Russia's leading academician in the area of minerals processing, and uh, Noel Finkelstein, who spent most of his active life in South Africa, but now lives in, uh, in Haifa in Israel. Wonderful man, and still I'm still in correspondence with him. Great people. So... At the end of the, 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 the day, we have to ask ourselves, were they all correct? Were, they, were these breakthroughs, uh, did, were they sustainable? And there are reservations which we should just remember to, and refer to. In terms of zeta potential, uh, Frank Applin, who was at Penn State and San Chanda, great, great uh, researchers, stated at uh, later on in life, so to speak, Zeta potentials have had a limited value in characterizing reagent mineral interactions. These are simply sobering comments to make us remember that the zeta potential measurement is a very interesting and very valuable parameter to measure, but it's not necessarily going to be the deal breaker when we are designing a flotation circuit, put simply. Then reagent adsorption, there are many different roles on a reagent Doug Fursadan Pradeep. Pradeep, of course, is now retired, lives in Pune in India. Great, great researcher. Uh, made the point that if the presence of a simple electrolyte, such as sodium chloride, can directly affect specific adsorption. Now, this is a very important statement because today, and I'm going to refer to it in my challenges for the future, the whole role of recycled water 
in the closed water circuit concept means that the ionic strength of the processed water is going to continue to increase. And so as the ionic strength of the water increases, it's going to play a major role in the adsorption of the reagents onto the mineral, or it may play a major role. Contact angle, I've made the comment already about Nagaraj and Ravi Shankar's uh, comments, not to belittle contact angle. It's a very interesting, a very valuable indicator of hydrophobicity. But there may other, be other superior methods to predict hydrophobicity of a collector adsorbed onto a mineral. And then potential control flotation. Uh, I've Graham Hayes and Bill Traor at CSIRO, again, very well known to you, as indeed Ron Woods, were pioneers in looking at the possibility of using potential controlled flotation. Uh, Ron Woods, in a paper that he wrote, a, a review paper some years ago, made the comment that it is unlikely that there will ever be a general application of potential controlled flotation. Some of the reservations around this have come from work that was done by Zafia Ekmeki in Turkey on using uh, mineral-specific electrodes. The problem with mineral-specific electrodes is that they are contaminated very, rap very rapidly in the pulp, and therefore uh, the integrity of the data that we are achieving, obtaining from such electrodes, is, is uh, questionable. Now, in terms of reagent development, we have um, uh, some interesting uh, uh, history. I've referred in my opening comments to the very early application of flotation, which was called oil flotation. But the very beginning of flotation, as we know, as you know better than I do in Australia, in about 1907 or thereabouts at Broken Hill, was accompanied at roughly the same time by the development of xanthates by the company Mineral Separation Limited, 1923. So this year represents the centenary of the, the development of xanthates. And I think it's, again, sobering to reflect on the fact that in this age, when we are all trying to seek to develop so-called green reagents, that xanthates remain the collector of choice for sulfides globally. Now, that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't cease to try and develop alternative reagents that are more environmentally friendly, but the environmentally non-friendliness of xanthates is still questionable. What is not questionable is that in synthesizing xanthates, you're using chemicals such as carbon disulfide, which them in themselves or have some seriously serious challenges. So, but nevertheless, Xanthate, and if I may just uh, on an amusing note, uh, Nagaraj once said to me that his, his colleagues at Cytex said to him that one day when he passes on, uh, on top of his coffin, they're going to put a little vial of Xanthate with a message, sorry, Nag, they're still using Xanthate. 1954 saw the development of Z200. Now, my good friend Doug Furstenauer is of a view that the development of the dialkyl thionocarbamate Z200 was undoubtedly the most significant sulfide flotation reagent development since the invention of xanthates. Indeed, if I remember correctly, in that uh, Brisbane series on the centenary of flotation, this statement is quantified by pointing out what the dollar value has been of the increase in copper recoveries as a result of the use of Z200 since this time in 1954. Now, again, this seems to have been one of the golden eras of flotation, since in that same time, we saw the uh, advent of the PPG frothers. We saw the allyl esters of xanthates, widely used still today. Gua is a depressant, and CMC is a depressant. Uh, Gua, of course, less used today, simply because of its it, it's cost, it's very expensive, and unreliability of the plants which uh, produce the guar. CMC is still widely used globally as a depressant, all developed in the 1950s. And then in the present era, more and more, and I'm going to refer to this in, in my last few slides, the targeted design of, of designer reagents using molecular design, molecular modeling techniques to make predictive statements about the development of reagents. And I'll refer to this in my challenges for the future. 
Now, the concept of, uh, of uh, natural floatability has been around for a long time. Uh, Gaudin in the 1930s suggested the natural floatability of minerals was due to cleavages in the molecular structure. Lefkowski was of a view that all solids would be hydrophobic if they didn't carry any polar or ionic groups. Finkelstein put uh, down natural floatability to the formation of elemental sulfur. We know that elemental sulfur is very hydrophobic, and so any chance of elemental sulfur forming will make a sulfide mineral naturally hydrophobic. And then, of course, again, Mori Furstenau, as we had seen uh, earlier from Bessanov, the importance of oxygen concentration. When the oxygen concentration is low, uh, we can get a much higher recoveries. And it, there's an interesting application in China at a, at a concentrator, which is about 15,000 feet above sea level, probably similar to what we found at the very highest concentrators in the Andes, where there is a lot of natural flotation of sulfides occurring, and where the dissolved oxygen concentration uh, is is below five, uh, well below five ppm's uh, as opposed to say the normal eight ppm's. So there are, is some interesting, uh, real world uh, evidence that this this holds. And then, uh, as I have said, the Bill uh, Graham Hayes, Bill Tro, uh, and others have pointed out that it's pH dependent. Frosters, of course, play a hugely important role in flotation. I don't need to tell you all about that. You know that. And of course, we have a whole range of frothers. I've referred to the development of the PPGs in the 1950s, still widely used today. And most of those developments occurred at that time in, in Dow Chemicals in Midland, Michigan. And, uh, and of course, all of these aliphatic alcohols. There's a paper in the same proceedings that I referred to a number of times in this morning's talk or this afternoon's talk by a chap called Robel on frothers. I would strongly recommend you check this paper because this paper is the first definitive paper outlining the importance of the chemical composition, the uh, chemical properties and the chemical structure of a frother molecule and how all of those contribute to the role that the frother plays in uh, the frost, stru frost structure and its effectiveness in the interaction between frothers and collectors. So, so there's some jewels out there that we often ignore reading uh, because of the adv advent to my uh, students. I continually say that many people believe the world only began when Google started. Uh, and then some work by uh, Dick Klimple and uh, Ron Isherwood. This is a contentious uh, slide. It's, it's, a, it's the story of Leon Schulman's theory about the fact that uh, frothers uh, and it builds on the hemimarcel concept that you get a frother collector interaction occurring at the interface between the air and the bubble. And of course, what this cartoon what this cartoon is showing is that how we have the air surface, and of course, as we all know, we have the alkyl group in the air phase, and we have the 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 OH of the alcohol at the water interface, and how we have collectors on the the mineral uh, particle surface in a normal fashion. So we have the adsorption, could be a, a xanthate or whatever, with the alkyl group. And so what this theory proposes is that when the air bubble meets the, uh, the particle, we get hemimicelles forming between the frother molecules and the collector molecules. It's somewhat contentious. Uh, there are some people who swear by this. I'm always reminded myself, years ago with my good friend Rob Dunn, I went up to a plant called Leinster in Western Australia, where they had the biggest column flotation cells I've ever seen in my life. They were 18 meters high. And they never used any frother on this plant because the water was so hard, the ionic strength so high, they didn't need a frother. And yet it worked perfectly normally. So there are a lot of examples where, in fact, you can get efficient flotation behavior without the presence of a frother molecule uh, because of the presence of high ionic strengths. Frost stability, again, one of the key uh, aspects of flotation. Dudenkov, way back in the 1960s, showed that well-dispersed hydrophobic particles can destabilize frost. And of course, this led to a lot of work where we know where that the, the hydrophobicity of the particles in the frost phase 
can stabilize or destabilize the froth. Dupinar in the, at NIM in the 1970s, in a seminal paper, it's a great paper actually, um, uh, showed the, how the relative strength of hydrophobicity of particles all impact on the stability of a froth. Graham Jamison has done a lot of work on this, together with his dear colleagues here, Atta, and it all comes down to the fact that optimum flotation requires a froth which is both not too stable, nor indeed insufficiently stable. But it goes back to the 1960s and 1970s, this concept. And of course, we have a great work that was done on frothers, both at the University of British Columbia, Janusz Lewskowski and Jim Finch, both of these two great scientists, recipients of the Lifetime Achievement Award of the IMPC. Lewskowski at UBC, developing the concept of critical coalescence concentration. Jim Finch and colleagues developing these concepts even further, the con concept of concentration at minimum velocity. Great work that Jim has done during his uh, eminent career in this area. Activation, there's a huge amount of literature on activation. Gaudin proposed that sphalerite activation by copper sulfate occurred as a result of ion exchange between zinc and copper. There are other views that uh, this really is a um, story of the uh, reduction uh, of copper two to copper one, accompanied by the oxidation of sulfide to elemental sulfur. So there's a lot of literature, some of it confusing, on the relative roles of uh, copper sulfate as an activator, as an example of an activator. And um, I'm not going to dwell on this, but a student of mine a number of years ago, when we were using top sims to look in, in the platinum concentrators in South Africa, copper sulfate was widely used. And we were able to show that the copper sulfate actually activated pyroxene particles. And the top sims showed it beautifully by showing how the copper was present on the pyroxene particles, activating them, which is certainly not what was uh, wanted. Depressants are referred to GWA and CMC. Sodium silicate, gaining a lot of interest today, is a dispersant uh, developed in the 1950s uh, by Stollenberger and Greenwald, and now very widely used in the PGM industry. And Maury first and I in the 1960s, showing that at high pH, so the controlling of the flotation of different sulfides, especially of um, pyrite, which is a big challenge to control flotation of pyrite using pH. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wrapping up my talk, uh, the challenges and opportunities for the future. This is a very interesting slide. Way back in 2010, when I was president of the International Mineral Processing Council, uh, our education commission wonderfully led at that time by Diana Drinkwater, well-known to you all, and Jan Sillier, also well-known to you, and Kerry Heiskanen, did a survey, global survey of the supply of minerals processing scientists, engineers, uh, 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 and they could be defined as chemical engineers, chemists, mechanical engineers, but they went into the minerals processing industry. The global production at that time was around about 5,500 of whom, not surprisingly, 3,000 were from China. What was to me of concern, let me put it that way, that scarcely 5% of the total number of graduates in 2010 came from North America, Western Europe, and Australia combined. You see Australia 40, Western Europe 50, and North America 175. And I need hardly point out to you that throughout this talk I've given this afternoon, the dominant people in terms of the great breakthroughs of the last 70 years have come from indeed Australia, Western Europe, North America. And so one is left asking the question, where are the next generation of Furstenars and Gardans and Walks, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, going to come from? And so it is a challenge that we are all aware of, that we are all trying to address, but I think this is quite a sobering statistic. The next great challenge we are facing is the whole story of the closed water circuit. This is a little pictorial diagram of what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make sure that the water that comes out of the process can be recycled. Our own research group here at the University of Cape Town in, a combina in, co in combination with uh, uh, Metsa Ototech is doing a lot of work on this. It's a, it's a very large project. Um, 
on trying to develop methodologies and protocols. And the question is, how often can you let this cycle continue before you start affecting the grades and recoveries? And the early indications are that, in fact, you can carry out many cycles, that as the ionic strength is building up, I referred to this earlier, in, in first and last point about adsorption, the effect of sodium chloride on adsorption. Well, we're not finding any great deleterious effect of the recycled water. And again, this is quite an interesting phenomenon because working with the Finns in Northern Finland, there are operations that can't get a license to operate because they're not allowed to allow any water to leave the concentrators plant because there's really so much water in the environment. Whereas, as you all would appreciate, at Chukikamata in northern Chile, where the annual, annual, annual rainfall is one millimeter, uh, the use of water is, is such that it's a most precious commodity. Then I mentioned molecular modeling design. We are doing quite a lot of work of this at the University of Cape Town, together with colleagues, physicists uh, who are doing this work, and our chemists. So what we are doing is we are doing the um, scanning of candidate molecules. So we deserve... Uh, we do the uh, identification of candidate molecules, the uh, computational molecular modeling people then carry out studies to identify those which look the most likely. Our chemistry department at the University of Cape Town has got now quite a large active group synthesizing these molecules, and we are confident that we are making quite a bit of progress. We carry out microcalorimetry studies, which determines delta H, to see whether we can validate the delta Gs that the molecular modeling people will give us. So there's an element of surface uh, val validation of the da data that we are obtaining. I think this is an exciting area of research. The Chinese are doing a lot of work in this area at the moment. Tailings treatment, again, I need hardly remind you of some of the terrible tragic disasters of the last 10, 20 years of tailings dam failures, so much so that in many jurisdictions around the world today, you may not have tailings that are other than dry. So the production of dry tailings, which of course then talks to the whole concept of the closed water cycle, because the water that you, you extract from the tailings, you will use again as processed water. That's a major, major challenge. And so the management of, of tailings uh, using chemical methods is becoming a very big area of research. And then uh, the critical minerals. Uh, again, I need hardly remind you about this. Uh, many critical minerals, some of the figures that we are seeing about copper with the advent of the, the electric vehicle, the amount of copper that's going to be needed to, to produce. And this will involve the, the recovery of difficult to float copper bearing minerals. And so we have, for example, your example in the Olympic Dam, where you have difficult to float copper-bearing minerals that need to be recovered. And then we have lithium. Australia is one of the world's leading producers of lithium, and that's a wonderful opportunity to become the serious major global player in this, in this uh, arena. And so the, I am told that the flotation of lithium-bearing ores is quite susceptible to water quality. So here we have another challenge the effect of water quality, ionic strength on flotation of lithium bearing ores. And then these other rare minerals, indium, gallium, tantalum, and others, their flotation will undoubtedly play a role in ensuring high recoveries. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's such a popular trendy area today. I'm not going to dwell on it. Suffice to say that using fundamental modeling to predict the changes occurring in the chemical environment in a flotation cell is very challenging. And maybe in, in, in going forward, the only way we're going to be able to manage the predictability of the behavior of chemicals is using artificial intelligence and machine learning in ways which you are all aware of today as we move forward. Technology transfer, I'll show the picture of two great Australians here. Um, Bill Traer on the left and Graham Hayes on the right. They did wonderful work in the 1980s on um, transferring knowledge gained in the laboratory to operations. So I've had a long chat to Graham about this. The challenge is it's very expensive. Uh, 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 pieces of kit like the warm and came out of all of this work. 
And the, the Quem scan was used in a lot of this work, but it's very expensive, especially for a university research group. And so this is really the domain where universities should be working closely with supplier companies and operating companies to do the tech transfer, which is so important for the future development of flotation. Finally, I think it's critically important that the whole community of minerals processing should never forget the importance of integrating the whole cycle from mine planning to comminution to flotation. We need to take a more holistic approach to flotation. I'm so keen these days that when people are publishing work on flotation, I want to know how they prepared the, the ore, what sort of mill did they use, what sort of media did they have in the mill, did they have mild steel or, or chrome steel or ceramic balls or whatever, what was the lining of the mill. So a lot of these parameters are often forgotten, but it's critically important for us to have this holistic approach to flotation research. And so to conclude, again, I quote my great mentor, Doug, uh, Doug Furstenau, the flotation process did not come into being as a result of intensive fundamental research, but was developed over the years through a great deal of empirical and intuitive work on complex ores. Most of the basic research in this field has been concerned with the problem of explaining why existing processes work so well, which emphasizes that sentence I've just read, it's how important it is for researchers at research organizations, at universities, to keep in close contact at all times with the operations so that we understand exactly what the challenges are in the operations, what's working, what's not working, because that's how the progress will be made. And so in the view of Doug, we are now at the stage where any further substantial extension of the flotation process will demand even more profound understanding of the fundamental principles on which it is based. I thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Cyril. That's a that's a fantastic and, and thought-provoking presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, it, it is the end of the time. Some people will probably have to leave early to pick up their children or something like that, but uh, I'm sure a number of us will stay for a while and um, have a discussion. So if there's any questions, either just please unmute yourself or go ahead and type it in. George, you know what I would appreciate? I would appreciate if there are people out there who wish to disagree with me, because then we can make progress. <laughs> mm. George, uh, can I make a quick comment? Um, yes, please. Yeah. Peter Scales here, Cyril. Um, whilst you were talking, I contacted Tom Healy, and he says to say hello, number oh, one. Oh, great. And right. uh, so he's obviously okay because he's typing backwards and forwards during your talk. He said that uh, Jack Nixon was a senior lecturer in the mining department at the University of Melbourne in the early 1950s. Oh. And he oh. went to work for CRA Camelco um, in about 1956 and oh. was replaced by a guy called John Carr, who became Tom Healy's first master supervisor. Oh, that that's fantastic. And Salami, does he got any idea? Uh, and he said he's not aware of uh, where Stan Salami went or what he did. All he knows is he left in about 1955 or 56, but he's got no idea uh, where he went. Peter, that's such great. I really appreciate that because I've struggled to get. So he was a mining engineer. Well, no, so, it, 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 he, well, he was he was in the mining engineering, engineering department. department, which became okay. chemical engineering effectively. Uh, okay. So, but it's where Walk, et cetera, was based as well. Oh, uh, that's originally. wonderful, Peter. Thanks so much for that. That's great. I'm now, that's been a, a little bit of the jigsaw puzzle that I haven't been able to find. So thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate so, that. So I've left it in the notes, but Tom Tom uh, said he didn't know him very well, but he knew of him. Yeah. Yeah, well, it goes back to 1952, 53. I guess Tom was uh, still early was days a, of Tom's career. Yeah. yeah oh, thanks, young. Peter. And, and again, thanks so much to Tom. I uh, really appreciate that. So, Cyril, it's Kevin. Hi, hi Kevin. How are you? Great. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Really enjoyed your talk. And it's uh, great to get that, you know, continuous historical perspective. 
you know, we, we all pick up the literature in bits and pieces, but it's nice to have it all um, tied up in, in, into a bit of a continuum there. And that's re really appreciated. Is this talk the talk that you gave um, for your award? Or similar? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, much of it is. I mean, I, I it was it was a it was a twenty minute talk when I. You mean the Gardan uh, event? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, it was. It, I trimmed it quite a lot, but but yeah, it, yeah, it worked, worked quite well because of yes. course the Gardan uh, was uh, featured quite a bit in my presentation. Yes, but yes, so, Kevin, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so so it's great for us to be able to in, in, enjoy the a good bit of the presentation that you would have given for that uh, that award. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much for your kind comments. Thanks, Kevin. Lisa has a question, comment? Uh, I do. Thank you, George. Uh, Cyril, it's always a pleasure listening to you speak. I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw one out there and see how we go with a discussion that you like so much. Um, in my opinion, one of the biggest factors holding us back in terms of understanding the true impact of chemistry and mineral flotation is our insistence on studying model mineral systems, um, particularly when it comes to base metal sulfides, because we completely ignore the aspect of mineral-mineral interactions, both between different particles but in phases of a composite particle. Um, what's your take on that, and how well, do you get around it? Well, well, you know, it's interesting because uh, I've exactly had such a conversation with the great Doug Persona, uh, and Doug's answer is probably the classic answer. You know, it's good to start with something like the pure mineral and build from that. But, but the other point of view that I have is that we're actually in the business of gang management, and so, so as you know better than I, the, 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 the most of the particles we're dealing with are gang particles. Uh, and so the importance of understanding the interaction, exactly with the point you just made, the interaction between the reagents that we are using and the gang particles, because the gang particles dominate the whole system, and these uh, valuable particles have to uh, navigate their way through these gang particles to achieve, uh, to, to reach the launder. And so um, I, I think it's quite useful to start as a building block with pure mineral, but I couldn't agree more with you. You know, that's, that's an interesting starting point, but it's only a starting point because at the end of the day, we've got to unravel uh, what's going on. Now, that's where the mineralogy comes in. And I think the, 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 the fact that we've got all these fantastic tools available today to understand what's in the tailings, because as you would know, Lisa, very well in the PGM area where we dominate a lot of our research, it's an understanding what's in the tailings, which is the same for such great importance. And so, um, uh, so when we so the what if in carrying out experimental work in the in terms of the the domain of chemical factors is uh, what has happened to it to the tailings, uh, because that will tell you a lot about where the reagents have have done their job or where they haven't done their job. So yes, I I think you know it's good to start. The trouble with these pure minerals is what do you talk about when you talk about a pure mineral? We got a sample of sphalerite recently. From uh, from Ward in in the states, well, it was it was it was junk. It was rubbish. Uh, when it, we know the XRD just showed that in fact we had bought a chunk of some stuff that we didn't know what it was. So so getting nice samples of pure minerals. What we are doing in the PGM arena uh, these days, again, you would know about this work, is we're synthesizing some of these Correct. very rare minerals like spirulite. And so we synthesize the spirulite, and we have been able to show. That spirulite just doesn't want to be floated. It just doesn't interact. It's, and now we're entering into the realm of valence band, conduction band story. And and uh, and of course, that takes you into serious fundamental stuff. So there's a point of view now that the whole role of synergy, when we talk about mixtures of collectors, is that one of the collectors may be reducing the gap between the, the valence band and the conduction band and enabling the other collector to do its job of absorbing. I mean, this is just an hypothesis, but so, so there are times when the pure mineral can can be maybe the only option, such as in the case of spirulite and tellurides and, tellur and so on. But yeah, your point is well made. You know, we've got to stay in touch with the real world. Yeah, I, I do agree that it's a good starting point because one does have to start somewhere. But I, I am concerned where I continue to see the starting point also being the end point. 
And yeah, I that's think right. that's kind of that's my right. concern for 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 this yeah. level of research. I've got another point, right. sorry, unless somebody else wants to raise a hand, is that so much of the work that you've presented, you just show that the absolute level of dominance that the area of base metal sulfide research has had in the realm of flotation reagent development with an absolutely overwhelming majority of the work being done in xanthates and thiols and associated reagents. But now when we're moving into the new brave new world of critical minerals and rare earths and lithium and vanadium, we are now starting to see that we need to start to move beyond xanthates and beyond thiols into understanding how going back to the drawing board and understanding how fatty acids work because we know they do but we don't know how so um in your view sort of what are what is going to be the biggest um area of incumbent research and the kind of areas that we should focus on to better understand um oxide and silicate targeted collectors well, well, that's that's a, that's a fascinating question because uh, you you sort of highlighted the, one of the major challenges of the future, uh, and I, I just want to share with you that in our little centre here at Cape Town, um, we've just had some in the last say six months we've had some really great developments. Uh, they they're small steps, but they relatively speaking, as far as we're concerned, quite great using molecular modelling to identify candidate molecules uh, based on the molecular, uh, the atomic structure of the mineral. So for example, if we are looking at spherulite in particular, which is palladium arsenide. So, so the interaction, the use of molecular modeling to look at the interaction between novel candidates, molecules and the surface does start to give you some information at, at homes in. So we started with about 40 or 50 candidate molecules which our chemists felt were really potentially strong uh, candidates for absorbing either on the platinum or the arsenic. And once we did the molecular modeling, they were able to show, and by the way, in the molecular modeling, a lot of people forget to put a, a molecule called H2O in. H2O is uh, the most important reagent, as you know. Um, we started to identify five or six or seven that looked quite, quite interesting. And then the chemists have gone off and synthesized there. Now, synthesizing small quantities of five or six or seven reagents is a much easier job, clearly, than, than 30 or 40. So, so using those techniques, we can see to what extent we can move away from thiols and find candidate molecules that may do the same job of absorbing onto the mineral surface and then test them in the laboratory, starting again with small steps. So I think... I think the the opportunity for and of course I, I I think by the way that type of approach it talks a little bit to the whole concept of inductive and deductive research because the in the in the deductive research arena we don't know what's going to work so we carry out a bunch of experiments and try to home in on something that may look like it's starting to work and that's not a bad way to go either so when you're talking about lithium ores my good friend Rob Dunn has told me and based on his experience that the lithium ores are very subject to the effects of high ionic strength in the water. Now, you know, the, the first step would be to take a bunch of lithium ores and just do some broad brush uh, uh, experiments to get a sense of where you, where the, how the land lies. But then going to the fundamental design of molecular structure of the, of the mineral and the molecular modeling of reagents, candidate uh, molecules, that's looking like I, I've been quite skeptical about it, but it's looking like it's starting to produce some interesting results. And, you know, time will tell. Can I make, you asked for someone to disagree with you. So I'll, I agree with you in the sense, um, you, you showed the adsorption energies on the, the 111 plane and the 100 plane, et cetera, which is a good start. But in my experience, the reagents adsorb uh, more strongly on defects. If you have a step, on the, the the plane or surface or a defect, I think you know that's the next stage. Pe people have to get out with the with the modeling. Yeah, you know, George, uh, 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 I spent quite a bit of my life doing catalysis research, and of course, the world was dominated by the fact that that you need to have a dominant of one 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 faces, 
And in fact, there was a time in the catalysis community where people were saying, can we manufacture tons of catalysts, especially zeolites, where the dominant phase was the 111? Well, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, I suppose it's a case of, well, I, I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right in what you're saying, but it's a case of, well, let's start somewhere yeah. and start identifying some candidate molecules. But yeah. sure, you know, yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a, these are little baby steps at this time. Sorry, I'm going to pop in again. I'm, I'm going to agree with George in that looking at particular mineral phases for a mineral particle that comes through several stages of crushing and grinding. Yeah, yeah. Um, can we even expect it to have any kind of defined crystalline phase? And we see this a lot in um, spodumene studies at the moment that are also looking at the emphasis of certain crystalline planes being more or less hydrophobic. But how can we even think of the fine crystalline planes for something that came through a comminution circuit? No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, I mean, this is, this is cloud cuckoo land stuff to say you're going to get one, one, one faces dominant or one oh faces dominant. Mm -hmm. But the point is that, so, so we're going to have a, a totally heterogeneous distribution of mm -hmm. whatever face you've got. And in fact, whether it's crystalline at all is a question. Yeah. So you're you're absolutely right, but I guess it comes back again to, you know, these are baby steps in the whole area of trying to identify candidate molecules which will work and make a particle hydrophobic, and the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You know, you've got to take the real ore and then test it. So you're absolutely right, Lisa, and I agree with you and George. But so uh, this is the storyline, and the other point is that the the challenge we found, by the way is that when you start working with these molecular modeling boffins who often don't know much about flotation, like the water story, we had to remind them to put H2O in. <laughs> because once the, once you put water into this into this whole uh, story, uh, the, the numbers come out quite different. And so, um, yeah, you know, it, it's bringing together different disciplines of the chemists and the solitate physicists and the flotation engineers, so to speak, and and you're absolutely right in what you're saying, because at the end of the day, you've got to put the stuff into a flotation cell and see whether it works. And of course, even then, you'll have the skeptics who will say, why are you trying to test this in a batch flotation cell? You've got to go onto the plant. It's, we know all the story, but but yeah. you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beginning of a storyline. And I don't know that there are many groups around the world today who are doing this sort of work. It may turn out to be a cul-de-sac, but I think we've got to look at this as an opportunity to to achieve these, to produce these reagents, which are more amenable to floating oh, these rare minerals. Go. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Cyril. Yeah. I, I um, think... yeah sorry, I, think I have to go. Apparently, there's a hailstorm about to hit, so I need to leave. <laughs> Cyril, absolute yeah. pleasure. Great, Lisa. <laughs> nice chatting to you. Keep well, eh? Look, look after yourself. Thank you. Bye. I, I think we, we have had a good discussion, and I think probably yeah. some other people do need to go, and you probably yeah. need to get your breakfast before you. Well, I, I, I've got to get to a meeting. We've got a, we've got a research day taking place on campus, so I've got to get off to that. So yeah. I'll also be happy to call it quits, George. But thank you very much, George, and to your audience for the, the feedback. I appreciate it, and especially to Peter for, for Tom's message. That's been great. Thanks. Yeah. No, it was really good to, to hear from you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again next time.